I just think the perfect way to start the video, just post a picture of Tones and I and I. You know, I think it'd be a good way to start. Odds are that by now, you've probably heard at least a snippet of the 2019 hit, Dance Monkey. The song that has been streamed well over a billion times from Australian artist Tones and I. And yet, at the time she released it, Tones was still so new to the industry that even though her song was charting number one across the world, she barely understood what a music chart was. This lack of familiarity in regards to the industry only makes what Tones managed to accomplish all the more remarkable. A self-taught producer, this young woman began tinkering with music while working retail and living in Melbourne. She managed to find her niche by combining piano melodies with electronic beats, something that she was inspired to explore after hearing the work of Macklemore. So how did she go from fangirl to the top of the charts, and how has she achieved seemingly the impossible almost solely on her own? Well, you're about to find out on our brand new episode of Before They Were Famous. But before we dig up all the details on her past, please remember to like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to get alerts whenever we drop new content. Without further ado, let's get right into this story. Tones and I was born Tony Watson on the Mornington Peninsula of Australia, an area of the country that's just south of Melbourne. Her age is something of a question mark, and when she first arrived on the scene in 2019, it was believed that she was only 19 years old. And since then, it's come to light that she's probably a little bit older than that and was likely born in 1993 as opposed to 2000. When asked to comment on the discrepancy of her age, Tony would tell Rolling Stone, I never denied my age. I never lied about it. I just don't say anything now. Like myself, as a kid, Tone's greatest passion was for basketball, and she played it every year from the time she was only four years old. Catching up with Tones myself, she gave a really in-depth insight as to why basketball was so important for her upbringing. Music and basketball were a very big uh, source of your happiness as a, as a child. Basketball was like pretty much the biggest thing for me as a child too, so I'm curious, you know, um, how, how was basketball, you know, sort of a big thing for you? I think that um, basketball for me was the first time I ever used something to consume my life from how I was feeling as a child or stuff I was, was going through. And I would run to school with a basketball, run home from school and then run to training, which as a child that was seven kilometres away, where I would coach a, a, a younger kids team and then from that stadium run to my stadium wow. my training which, which would finish at 10 p.m and then i ended up on my own getting a scholarship to a basketball school um which originally was told i couldn't go to but then convinced my family to change their mind and that was a four-hour commute every day holy um, yeah, I, I really used it as a coping mechanism. I coached many teams and I refereed was my first job. And then when I quit basketball, the only reason I ever did is because I was ready. I realized as a female in the basketball industry at my height, there was just no way. But as an artist, which was my other passion, there might have been a chance. So I took every bit of aggression or every bit of uh, inspiration and, and the, all that hard work and dedication and monotonous repetition and put that into music and and i just just swapped completely over i didn't work any less for music than i did on basketball or anymore and i think that it might have been maybe the best decision of my life growing up she stored all of her time and energy in the competing at progressively higher levels so why did she throw so much of herself into that sport well it may be because at home tony felt like the black sheep of her family in the autobiographical song bad child tones would write my family always said i was the bad child throwing me away into the bad pile. All my life, being put in on a fake smile, sitting on my own, feeling like I'm exiled. Yeah, to be honest, man, bars, it's a good rhyme. While struggling to make it out of her difficult childhood, Tones developed a second passion for music. It happened while she was around seven years old and her extended family was having a get together at a local park with all of her cousins. That's when she and her cousins began singing a song and her aunt recognized that out of all of them, Tones was the one who could really hold the note. But with such a lackluster support system in place, Tones had to rely on herself on how to sing. She became self-taught and tracked much of her own progress by posting acapella versions of famous songs on her YouTube channel starting around 2009 but didn't remain consistent with it. Then, during high school, she learned how to play keyboard, and from there, she graduated to a drum pad and sound effects. Afterwards, she began working retail at a clothing store, where she stayed for a number of years until she decided to take two weeks off to pursue her musical dreams. The weekend worked retail too. What is it with people with amazing voices that always work retail? 
I don't know. Part of the process, I guess. With money she had saved up from her job, she bought herself an RC300 loop station got to work figuring out how to use it. And once she had, Tones left her home and traveled to Melbourne, where she performed at small time gigs and festivals. Other times, she'd take trips to the beachside town of Byron Bay, where she'd busk her for passing crowds. She explained the standard UK, I was living in my van, playing on the street for almost two years. When I started busking, I had no money, but I was the happiest I've ever been in my life. On her very first night of busking, a music lawyer offered her his card, along with some support and advice. A month later, she bit the bullet, quit her job outright and drove back to Byron, this time for good. She gave the lawyer a call and he helped her get picked up by a management company. For the next year, Tones mostly lived out of her van while performing on the city streets and honing her craft. Then, in February of 2019, she sent a song that she had written titled Johnny Runaway to Triple J Unearthed, a radio station project for newcomers. The track told the story of a friend of hers coming out as gay to his father. It got played on the radio station the same day that Tone sent it in, and by March, it had hit number 12 on the Australian charts. And just like that, all of Tone's hard work had finally paid off, but little did she know what was coming around the corner next. Also, another fun fact about Tones and that song Johnny Runaway, the bridge originally started as a rap verse that she was just writing for fun. When I asked her about it myself, I found out that Tones, Tones low-key got some bars. I'm not even lying, she got some bars. Macklemore, watch out. Hey there, Tones, my old friend. What are you doing? How have you been? Oh, still singing? That's cute. Then I've flown to Europe and back again. But like, what are your real life goals? You know, something to be proud of when you get old. And usually I, I just roll my eyes and say, oh yeah, I forgot I strip on the side. It's just- it Bars. It wasn't even- Bars. It wasn't even <laughs> like for a song. I was just so mad. After establishing herself as a presence on Australia's alternative stations, Tones signed a deal with the Sony affiliated Bad Bad records and set about releasing what would become her biggest hit at least to this point in time of course i'm talking about the inescapable dance monkey tone's original intention for the song was to create a party starter with a conscience you know a feel-good track for her and her friends to dance to during the nights spent at local hostels that also addressed sometimes unrealistic expectations of live audiences but she had no idea that once she would release it it would take a life of its own it's a mix of positive messages mixed with like i was how frustrated i was after that night um, but usually it's very beautiful and there's a lot of love, but yeah, that song actually came from a place where I wasn't okay. The single first gained popularity during her live shows, but then it began to take off on streaming platforms like Shazam and Spotify. In fact, it got so big so fast that it set an Australian record for the amount of time spent at number one topping the charts in over 30 countries around the world. As for Tones, well, she barely even knew what a music chart was. She told Rolling Stone, I never knew there were music charts before I released my music online. I never looked at charts or anything. I just listened to the music that I liked. Soon enough, the track was dethroning Camila Cabello's Havana as the most streamed song by a lead female artist on Spotify with over 1.5 billion streams. And I don't wanna have to be the one to project negativity, but I feel like there's a lot of people that look at this as just an act of service for dethroning that song to begin with. No hate. Free YSL. But of course, with success like that comes an army of haters, and Tones wasn't exactly ready for it. She told the radio show Carrie and Tommy, people kind of want you to hate yourself a little bit. When you're busking, no one cared what you looked like. I never looked at myself and thought anything. And through that whole first year of mainstream success, I thought, I'm gross. I'm not good looking. I'm just gross. I should hate myself. She had to work extra hard to stop herself from thinking this way and came to the realization that she shouldn't compromise her own integrity based upon the comments of others. Instead, she worked through her issues by perfecting her debut album. Exactly. Put, put that energy, all that hate and negativity into a great piece of art. I love when artists do that, man. After her 2019 EP, The Kids Are Coming, would go certified platinum, there was a lot of pressure riding on Tones' first full-length project, Welcome to the Madhouse. And when it finally dropped in 2021, it became a massive hit and immediately shot to the number one spot in Australia. And while this latest accomplishment left her feeling extremely proud, she's less enthused when it comes to her most infamous hit, Dance Monkey. During an interview with Nova FM's Smallsy Surgery, Tones admitted that the popularity of this song painted her into a corner and while she still feels the song is great, she simply just doesn't want to go there anymore. And that's not all. During another interview, this time on Breakfast with Gandhi and Maz, Tones revealed that she plans on retiring from performing altogether sometime in the next four years. I don't know if there's any bigger testament to success than early retirement, so good for you, Tones. I'd love to retire in the next four years too, man. Jeez. But before that happens, Tones did have the opportunity to work with one of her musical icons, Macklemore, on his new single, Chant. 
She actually told me that she got to go thrift shopping with Macklemore himself, which I think is completely iconic. Thrift shopping with Macklemore, it's like playing basketball with Michael Jordan, man, come on. I know Macklemore is also your favorite artist, so what was that like, that process of getting to work with him? It was extra special because he found out how much of a fan I was back in 2019. And so he came and surprised me backstage at my Seattle show. And I was backstage and I just hear like the crowd going crazy and I was like, what? I'm not on for like two hours, two and a half hours. What was that cheering for? <laughs> I went into the, the, my good friend's live cordial who was supporting me and I walked in. I was like, guys, are you going on now? They're like, no, we're not on for like 40 minutes. I was like, what is going on? I was screaming. And then I realized in this particular venue in Seattle, you can't get backstage without walking across the front of the stage. Mm -hmm. So at this very moment, Macklemore was actually walking to backstage and then all of a sudden I like, knock on the dressing room door, like just like I'm sitting here now. And he just walked in and we had a great chat. He watched my show and then next minute he like hit me up and he's like, I want you to come back. I want to work with you. We were in the studio for a day. To be honest, we talked a lot. I was going through a really hard time. I was going from zero to a hundred in an industry that's like fueled by social media comments. I, it was like really good to have that moment with him. And then we kept in contact and he hit me up again. He's like, this is a song, like, let's let's do this. And I flew over last year and, and we recorded some parts and just like we went through shopping together. <laughs> that's and amazing. Every time I meet him, meet up with him, he actually is just as genuine and just as great. I actually surprised him while we were filming the film clip. There was a tattoo shop next door. So I surprised him. I haven't actually told anyone this yet. And got the lyrics tattooed on my arm. And wow. they were just like, hey, Tones wants you. She's just next door. And he came in and I got his lyrics from the song. Wow. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> wow. From busking in the city streets only three short years ago to becoming her home country's most popular artist, it's been an unbelievable rapid rise to fame for Tones and I. Where will she go next from here? Well, we can only wait and see. I mean, after all, this is before they were famous. But thank you everybody for watching this latest episode. Please let us know what you thought about her story in the comment section down below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. If you'd like to check out a few other videos, then search for our recent looks into the come up of PBE Pluto, Hit Kid, or Blast. My name is Clyde Smith, and I'll see you guys in another video.